guys, so we are going to pick up where we left off on page 130 at the very bottom. Um, house with a cluck in its walls. Late that same night, Lewis lay awake in his bed listening to Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman talking. They were in the study below, and as usual, their voices drifted up the hot air register. And as usual, he couldn't quite make out what they were saying. He got out of bed and crawled over to the wooden grating in the floor. A warm breath of heat softly beat at his face. He listened. Even now, he just couldn't hear well enough. There was only one thing he could do. He had to use the secret passageway. Lewis put on his bathrobe and tiptoed down the back stairs. The kitchen was dark. Good. Slowly, carefully, he removed the china from the shelves of the china cupboard. Then he tripped the hidden spring and the cupboard swung outward. He walked softly in. This time, Lewis remembered to bring his flashlight. Not that he needed it much. He didn't have to go far. Um, and some light shone through many um, chinks in the cobwebbed passage. Before long, he was standing behind the bookcase that lined the wall of Jonathan's study. He peered through a crack in the boards, and there beyond the books were Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman. Mrs. Zimmerman had just conjured up a match out of thin air, and she was lighting a long, twisted cigar with it. She blew the smoke out of both corners of her mouth. Well, now we know, she said. Yes, now we know, Jonathan's voice came from his leather armchair where he sat slumped. All that Lewis could see of him was one blue sleeved arm and a set of hairy knuckles grasping the chair arm. The question is, Jonathan went on, can we do anything about it? Mrs. Zimmerman began to pace. Cigar smoke trailed off behind her. She scraped a large purple stone um, um, ring along the whole length of the bookshelf. Do, she said, do? We fight them. What else? Jonathan gave a hoarse laugh. It made Lewis feel very uncomfortable. Easier said than done, Florence. They're both stronger than we are, you know. We only fiddle around with magic. They gave their lives to it. As for her, she may have quite literally given her life for it. But why would they want to do what they're going to do, said Mrs. Zimmerman, folding her arms and puffing angrily at her cigar. Why? This beautiful world. End it. Why? Jonathan thought in a minute. Well, Florence, I can't really see into a working mind of Isaac Izzard. But I'd say the answer was scientific curiosity. Think of all that's been written about the last day. Graves opening, bodies rising up, fresh and new. Some think there will be a whole new earth, much better than this present one. Wouldn't you like to see it? And another thing occurs to me. Isaac and Selina Izzard didn't enjoy this world very much. Why shouldn't they try for the next one? Jonathan puffed on his hookah. There was silence for several minutes. And the clock, said Mrs. Zimmerman, I have to hand it to you. You were dead right. There is a real literal clock in these walls. He calls it a device, but it has to be a clock. He wasn't kind enough to tell us where it was, of course, though it seemed to me that he tells practically everything else. He even hints about where he hid the key. Not that that matters now. She broke her cigar in two and threw it into the fireplace. But there's one thing I'd like to know, she said, turning suddenly to Jonathan. Why did he need a clock to bring about the end of the world? Lewis gasped and put his hand over his mouth. Then it was going to be the end of the world after all. Because he lost the moment, Jonathan answered, um, the moment he had been seeking all those years. It was quite a search that old Isaac made. That's why he had all those crazy notes about mackerel skies and last judgment skies and clouds that look like chariots and trumpets and masks of doom. That was what he was after, a mask of doom, a sky that would be right for his incantations. Magic, sky magic is old stuff, as you know. The Romans used to, yes, yes, cut in Mrs. Zimmerman impatiently. I know all about the sky and the bird um, divination. Who's got the D mag A around here? Anyhow, all right. So the right sky comes along for old droopy drawers. Fine, dandy. So what? Uh, why doesn't he just wave his wand and turn us all it, turn us all into mully grubs? Because by the time he had made sure it was the right kind of sky, the sky had changed. It doesn't take long for the clouds to move and change their patterns, you know. Or maybe he lacked the heart to do it. It sounds silly, um, but I kept hoping that that's what held him off. Him? Lack of heart? Isaac Izzard? He was a hard man, Jonathan. He'd have to pull, or he'd have pulled his mother teeth one by one if he'd have them for some devil magic. Jonathan sighed. Maybe you're right. I don't know. The important thing is that he did miss his opportunity, and that's why he had to build a clock. 
to bring the time back, the exact time when everything was right and in its place. That's what he means when he talks about a device to redeem the time. Redeem, indeed. He wanted to destroy us all. Mrs. Zimmerman was pacing again. All right, she said. All right, so he built a clock. Why didn't he just wind it up? He couldn't. Not all the way up at any rate. Didn't you read the passage? Jonathan got up and went to the library table where the papers were lying. He picked them up and leafed until he found a page he wanted. Ah, here it is. But when the device was completed, I found that I lacked the skill to wind it up all the way. I have tried, but I must conclude that the one with greater power than I possess will be needed for the final adjustment. Curse the day she left me. Curse the day she went away. She might have done it. Jonathan looked up. In the last sentence, the word she is underlined four times. She, of course, is our friend across the street. Lewis closed his eyes. Mrs. O'Meager really was Mrs. Izzard then. He had guessed it, of course, but he hadn't been sure. Mrs. Izzard, um, and he had let her out. He felt like the stupidest, most foolish person in the whole world. Ah, yes, yeah, said Mrs. Zimmerman, smiling wryly. We shall see in the end who is stronger. But tell me one thing more, O oh Sage, since it seems that you have been cast in the role of the um, explicator um, and annotator of the testament of Isaac Izzard. Yes, what would you like to know, Florence? Well, he claims that the clock isn't wound all the way up, but it's been making a ticking sound for years now, a magic ticking that seems to be coming from behind every wall of this house. It's hard for me to believe that the clock isn't just whiling all the time away until Aunt... Uh, Auntie Izzard arrives with her key. What's the clock doing? Jonathan shrugged. Search me, Florence. Maybe it's trying to drag the house back into the past without the aid of that final adjustment. Maybe he fixed it so the ticking sound would scare anyone who might be foolish enough to come live in this house. Isaac didn't want his clock found by accident and destroyed, after all. I don't know why the clock is ticking, Florence, but I do know this. When Mrs. Izzard, Izzard, sorry, when Mrs. Izzard or whoever is over there puts the key in the slot of that clock and finishes the job that Isaac started, then at that moment, Isaac Izzard will return. You and I and Lewis will be ghosts or something worse. He'll be standing in the turret with powers in his right hand and the end of the world will come to pass. Lewis clamped both hands over his mouth. He fell to his knees, shuddering and sobbing. For a moment, he was on the verge of shouting, Here I am! Come and get me! So they could come and take him away and put him in the detention home for life. But he didn't shout. He didn't clamp, or he clamped his hands more tightly over his mouth, and he cried in muffled bursts that shook his whole body. He cried for a long time, and when he was through, he sat staring lifelessly at the dark wall of the passageway. Mrs. Zimmerman and Jonathan left the room. The fire burned low, but still Lewis sat there. His mouth was full of the taste of ammonia, and his eyes burned. He took his handkerchief out of his pocket of his bathrobe and blew his nose. Where was the flashlight? Ah, uh, here it was. He clicked it on. Lewis got up slowly and started to pick his way towards the entrance. Even though he was walking upright, he felt as if he were slinking. Now he was running his hand over the splintery back of the china cupboard. He tripped the spring and the cupboard swung silently outward. Lewis half expected to see Mrs. Zimmerman and Jonathan sitting there with their arms folded waiting for him. But the kitchen was dark and empty. Lewis went back up to his room. He felt as if he stayed awake three nights in a row. Without even stopping to take off his bathrobe, he threw himself onto the rumpled bed. Darkness filled his brain and he fell into a dead, dreamless sleep. We are going to stop there because that is at the very end of the chapter, um, page 137, and then we will pick back up where we left off. So make sure you guys are leaving a comment or questions or let me know what you're thinking so far of the book. We're, um, we only have this much left of it, so not a whole lot. It's getting good, though. All right, guys.